The first example here is a discovery of an early diagnostic marker that allows us to diagnose individuals as well as elucidate new targets for intervention. Now, there's many different diseases in which sapient works, as mentioned, or human or biological database, and one that we're particularly interested in is liver disease or NASH. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, as many of you are aware, uh, is an extremely complex disease, incredibly prevalent, but very hard to diagnose in humans and typically requires invasive liver biopsy, uh, which is a quite a morbid and, and dangerous procedure. And so we've worked together with partners to identify circulating small molecule diagnostic markers for underlying NASH. Now, the way we've approached these studies as shown here on this slide is to start from a population of over 10,000 individuals in which we have clinical phenotype data, and we know over time who develops a syndrome consistent with NASH by both liver enzymes as well as fat imaging of the liver. And when we take these 10,000 individuals and compare them to those individuals that do not develop NASH over time and analyze their blood, what we can do is measure these thousands of markers, capturing across these 10,000 individuals more than 50,000 circulating markers that are shown as these little gray dots on this volcano plot here to the left. Now, if we ask, are there markers that are specifically altered in individuals that go on to develop NASH versus those individuals that are controlled for age, gender, demographic features, glucose levels, et cetera, but do not develop NASH, what we find is that there's over a dozen molecules that are shown as these red prioritized dots on this plot here on the left that are drastically altered after accounting for multiple hypothesis testing in individuals that develop NASH. Mm -hmm. Now, as mentioned, the vast majority of molecules that we're capturing are unknown molecules, and only a small percentage of the small molecule biomarkers floating around in your blood today have ever been structurally elucidated. As is often the case, the most interesting molecules here, again, the ones that are shown in red, all represent unknown molecules that have never been assayed and never been characterized in humans or in other data sets. Now, when we look at these markers, there are ways in which we can begin to organize these into biological pathways. And one which, uh, one which approach by doing this is through molecular networking. Essentially, we can take all of these unknown molecules and by looking at their fragmentation patterns, we can cluster them according to biochemical pathways, which is what's shown here in the middle image. And when we do so, we find that three of these markers that are shown in blue all fall in the same biochemical pathway. These are all unique molecules, but also have very shared um, chemical features that allow them to work together uh, and operate in the same biological pathway. Now we can take one of these that's shown here as the key biomarker, isolate it out, solve its underlying structure, and develop diagnostic assays around this. We can also validate this in independent both human and preclinical studies as we've shown on the right here. Now, when we look at this one singular biomarker here, again, this is not a panel of markers, but just one single biomarker. When we look at it in additional human studies in individuals with biopsy proven NASH, and so these are individuals that have undergone biopsy and have a pathologic diagnosis of NASH, what you find is with increasing stage of NASH severity, the molecule is increasing in human blood. Interestingly enough, what we find is that in those individuals that all have stage 3 NASH, so these all have a very shared pathology again, uh, we see that there's great heterogeneity in underlying levels of this marker. And we see this on the top right panel here. There's a population of individuals with stage 3 NASH that have very, very high levels of this marker. And there's another population of individuals with stage 3 NASH. Once again, these are indistinguishable by pathology that have lower levels of this marker. Now, we have reason to believe that these individuals may have developed NASH for very different reasons and may respond to very different therapies. And this is once again important in being able to isolate out and substratify a population, all of that have a shared diagnosis, into those that may ultimately be responders versus non-responders for a particular therapeutic. Now, this is a molecule we can also validate in preclinical studies. Once again, these markers are among the most ancient of markers that are highly translated down to preclinical models. And so when we look at a preclinical model, we see that this is a marker that elevates in blood at the earliest sign of hepatic inflammation at several weeks. Whereas those individuals or those uh, sort of preclinical animals that develop a precursor state of NAFLD uh, do not have this marker in blood. Uh, we can begin to also examine this marker across greater 100,000 people now in our underlying human biological database, as I mentioned. And there's many questions we can begin to understand and amplify this underlying discovery. 
First, we can begin to ask, how early on in the disease process is this biomarker altered? And so when we look across 100,000 people, what we find is that this marker is elevated in individuals who ultimately go on to develop NASH up to 10 years in advance of formal clinical diagnosis. And so if we look at the plot here on the left, we find that individuals that have high levels of this marker, uh, relative to those individuals that have low levels of this marker, even though they're matched for age, gender, BMI, demographic features, glucose levels, triglyceride levels, et cetera, et cetera, we find that those individuals that have high levels of this marker have a five-fold increase in the development of NASH over subsequent uh, decade. As such, this is a marker that potentially may be used for isolating out these individuals for therapeutic intervention at very early stages before clinical diagnosis is typically made. In addition, we can also ask, how dynamic is this marker? How does it change over the course of a day? How does it change over the course of a year? How does it change in different geographic locations around the world and in different populations? And we find that this is remarkably stable with regards to times of day, diet, geographics, demographics. But what we do find is that those interventions that improve fatty liver infiltration actually result in a dynamic change in this marker. So if we look at those individuals before and after bariatric surgery, and as you're well aware, bariatric surgery can result in a drastic improvement in liver fat within several weeks, we find that this marker is dynamic and changes almost back down to normal states in individuals after they've undergone bariatric surgery. Now, this is extremely important in thinking about how one may leverage these markers as potentially surrogate endpoints as part of an early phase one, phase two program to evaluate potential efficacy of a therapeutic at a very early time point even before there's clinical evidence for improvement. Now, as mentioned, we can also do quite a bit of integration. Across our human biological database, we have over 20,000 individuals in which we have dense genomic measures with these same biomarkers assayed in blood. And essentially what we can do is the genome-wide association around this singular marker. And when we do so, we, we derive the Manhattan plot that's shown here on the left. What this allows us to do is to understand the actual biosynthetic enzymes and transport systems that allow this marker to be produced and to transport it into blood. Uh, in addition, given the, where these enzymes are expressed, we can actually begin to localize the production of this biomarker to the actual hepatocyte and even an organelle specifically within the hepatocyte. Now, one of the areas that we think a lot about here at Sapient is, is causal inference, meaning are these markers simply passive correlates of disease, which can be used as diagnostic parameters, or are these markers actually driving disease processes in a way that allow them to be actual therapeutic targets themselves? Now, there's many, many ways in which we begin to evaluate this, but in humans, we like to use a, a, an approach called causal inference through Mendelian randomization. And essentially, if we look at those genetic instruments that are shown here on the left that alter the level of this biomarker, and then ask across more than 500,000 individuals in our database, how does this actually influence the development of the disease? You obtain a graph as shown here on the right. And what we find is that those genetic variables, those common polymorphisms, again, that alter the underlying biomarker, also result in an increase in disease risk over time. And you see this linear relationship, again, as shown here on the right. And when you see this, it's extremely suggestive of an actual causal relationship between this biomarker, the pathway that gives rise to this marker, and ultimately disease. Now, this is a marker that's been elevated and advanced here at Sapient to our human clinical uh, CLIA laboratory for development of a CLIA diagnostic test, as well as the biological pathways that give rise to this, uh, given their causal inference, have been advanced towards new gene and, and cellular-based targeting mechanisms.